I was gonna do a completely different video today, just completely different, about something unrelated to the topic at hand, but something happened to me this morning uh, before I came to my studio to do this video. What happened was that I talked to a pastor, you know, just a lovely man. This uh, pastor is a Ukrainian pastor for a Christian denomination, and we were talking about different things, you know, and he's just uh, salt of the earth. He spoke very, very good English, and uh, we were having a very pleasant conversation, and he said something. He said something that struck me right between the eyes. It, it, it was something that really surprised me, okay? And what he said was that he had never seen the ocean. Uh, <laughs> this guy is about my age, right? He's 50 years old. And uh, he said he'd never seen the ocean. You know, he's a Ukrainian. And, and it made me think about my own situation, my own circumstance, and how many oceans have I seen? I actually lived in front of the Pacific Ocean for a while when I was 15. You know, to, to see your horizon nominated by that ocean is a sight to behold. I've been to the Northern Pacific all the way up to Anchorage, Alaska, and uh, I've swum in the, uh, in the Pacific around uh, California. I've also swum in the Caribbean, as well as the Atlantic. There are a few more oceans that I'd like to swim in before I kick the bucket, right? But, you know, for me, seeing the ocean is no big deal. And this fine man had never seen the ocean. Circumstances of his life, the fact that he was born in Ukraine and therefore had the wrong travel documents, and because of his chosen profession, he didn't have that much money. You know, traveling for him was not an easy thing. It was not an easy thing at all, right? And I thought to myself how lucky I was because I've been able to travel and see the world. I've lived in some of the most remarkable places in the world. And it got me thinking. It got me thinking, you know, very hard. When they ask terminal patients, when they ask old people what they most regret, you know what the top two answers are? The first thing they regret is that they didn't have a family, or didn't spend enough time with their family, or didn't have a big enough family. You know, they had only one kid maybe, instead of two or three or four or five, right? And the other regret that they have, the other regret that they have is that they didn't see enough of the world. You who are watching me, I mean, my audience is, uh, according to Google metrics, it's roughly 80% of my audience is between the ages of uh, 18 and 34. So you're young, presumably, you who are watching this video, right? Don't be foolish. Don't have that regret. Don't come to the age of 50 and say, well, I've never seen the ocean. Mm -mm. Especially not if you're living in the Western democracies. If you're living in Europe, in Canada, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, do you have any idea how fucking lucky you are? Because you got the golden ticket. You got the uh, Western democracy's um, passport. You know, any one of those countries that I just mentioned, you can grab that passport and travel anywhere in the world without a visa. You just hop on the plane and show up and they'll just stamp you and they'll say, welcome, and you can stay for 90 days, no problem. Think of it, think how lucky you are, right? And the cost, the cost is minimal. The cost today of air travel, because we are living at a peak of our civilization. You have to understand that. The, uh, the society today, our civilization today, it is a peak. It is, it, it is a, 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 a peak that will not be repeated. For various reasons, it is unlikely that we will have another period in history where we have such cheap transportation. I'm talking intercontinental transportation, okay? You can hop on a plane right this second just go to the airport right now, whatever you're doing, just go to any airport, any major airport in, in the United States and in the, uh, Europe, you know, a major airport is not more than a couple of hundred miles away. You get to that major airport and you hop on a plane and you can be on the other side of the globe within 24 hours at minimal cost. Minimal cost being, you know, maybe a couple of grand. I mean, if you're going to someplace really obscure at the last minute, yeah, maybe a couple of grand. A couple of grand, come on. Anybody today, any working stiff, can put together and scrape together $2,000. It's easy, you know? And you get to that city, that destination, that wherever, 
and you can go to Airbnb and you can uh, stay at some place for, again, minimal cost and you can see the world. You can see the world, so why aren't you doing that? Huh? Because you don't have enough money? That's always the excuse. People always say that they don't do something because they don't have the resources, they don't have the money, they don't have this, that, the other. They always need more, you know? No, that, that's just an excuse, and you and I both know it, see? It's an excuse to not break out of your inertia because it's understandable. What happens is to most people, you know, the life that they're living, even when it's unpleasant, even as they bitch about it every day, it's in a weird and perverse way, comfortable. Comfortable and it creates an inertia. And so people don't want to break this inertia. They don't want to leave where they are living. They are happy. Even when they are miserable, they're happy. They want to stay where they are and they make no effort to leave. Don't be like that. Break that inertia, especially when you're young. When you're young, when you don't have any real responsibilities, you only have responsibilities to yourself, and you have all of these decades in front of you, there is no excuse for you to not explore the world. In my own case, it happened pretty much by accident. See, when I finished college, I decided that I wanted to go to Hollywood to make it as a screenwriter. Uh, be it TV or film, I didn't know. I just wanted to make a living as a writer. So I, I flew out there and I lived in a while in LA until I got successful and then I moved to New York uh, to live it up in New York, right? And have a high old time, which I did. <laughs> and then after that, I moved to Santiago to uh, establish a, a film production business. And then after that, I decided I wanted to live in London because I thought it would be cool. And I thought it would be a great place for my kids to learn English. And then after that, oh, before that, actually, I'd forgotten. I'd lived in Paris for a while for the hell of it because I just wanted to go to Paris because I thought it would be cool. And I lived almost a year in Paris. And I also lived almost a year in Germany because there was my girlfriend, my girlfriend who became my wife, right? And now here I am in Ukraine and, um, and it's great. But the thing is, see, in my own case, I lived in these cities sort of by accident, you know? Uh, going to Paris, for instance, that was a whim. That was a flat out whim. It was like, yeah, why not? Sounds fun, you know? Maybe learn French. I got to France and realized that I suck at languages, but that doesn't matter. See, I moved there, I had a great time. I lived in Paris. I lived in London. I lived in New York. I lived in LA. That's wonderful. That's, that's, that's incredible, right? I wish I'd had the foresight to plan this out. And I count my lucky stars that my whims and fate took me to those different cities. Some of them I hated. I mean, like for instance, I hated London. I mean, quite frankly, I was there last year, right? And I did a lot of videos for this channel out of London because I fucking hated that city. I hate, I hate the Brits. I hate their whole fucking country. I just hated it, but like, I know that I hate it because I was there. I saw it, I saw it with my own two eyes. Right? I saw it with my own two eyes, then I smelled it with my own two nostrils and tasted it, and I just, ugh, and spit it out and left. But I know. And the fact that I know that I don't like it helps me to understand the things that I do like. The, the, the fact that I'm living here in Kharkov, right? It's, it's a shitty ass little city, but it has so many things that London doesn't have. Things that I personally enjoy tremendously, right? And there are other cities that I will go to because now, even though I'm 50, I've already made up my mind that I want to spend, I want to spend some years, at least two years, in at least three more cities before I kick the bucket, right? Well, that kind of attitude is a good thing because it's only with change that you grow. It's only by experiencing a new environment and adapting to it or failing to adapt to it that you learn more about yourself. You learn more about yourself and you learn more about the world, okay? You learn the quotidian things about living in these cities. Like for example, like I, I got to master, you know, what, what times of day and on what days the garbage truck would pass by in front of my apartment in Paris 
because it would wake me up at a certain time. And so, and because it would be so loud, it would wake me up, I wouldn't be able to fall asleep. And so, you know, I, I, I adjusted to that circumstance. I learned that kind of quotidian silliness. And I learned other things about myself that are much more important, of course, by living in these cities, see? You only experience growth, you only experience self-knowledge by rubbing up against the world. But if you rub up against the same spot all of your life, the same place, and you just settle there and never move, and never try and go out and see the ocean, well, you're never gonna grow, see? And, and why is growth so important? Why is learning about yourself so important? It's an end in itself. Yeah, sure, it has certain utility, you know, you, you, by knowing yourself and knowing your strengths and weaknesses, you're able to adapt to them and, uh, you know, maximize them in terms of, I don't know, making money or making friends or whatever, whatever is important to you, right? Yeah, sure. But see, learning about yourself is an end in itself. It, 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 it's its own use. You, you don't need it. it, it it's not utilitarian. It, it's just the thing that you want because it makes you bigger and, and makes you better. Because as you know yourself, you're able to either fix those deficiencies that you have, or at least put them aside and minimize the negative effects it'll have on your life. You see what I'm saying? I don't think I'm explaining myself very well, but let me, let me flip it around and go in a different direction. There is something so wonderful about being confident that you can handle yourself anywhere. Okay? I mean, I live here in Kharkov, right? I don't speak a lick of Russian. I mean, my, my vocabulary in Russian is um, spasiva, means thank you, dasvidanya, which means goodbye, uh, dobre utra, which means good morning, and vodka, which is uh, water, tap water. <laughs> but that's all I know of Russian, right? And yet I can handle myself. And I'm, I feel very confident. I feel very confident that I can handle myself. And most of the people here do not speak English. And so I'm forced to uh, interact with them with sort of like uh, pantomimes. Uh, it's, it's sort of like pantomime what I want and, and, and sort of like, uh, you know, point and make signs and all the rest of it. And, and I'm not gonna do it here in the video because I'm gonna feel ridiculous. But the point is that, see, I get by and I'm confident that I can get by. And I'm not scared of anything because I've seen enough of the world. I've been to some really shady spots in the world, in fucking lower Manhattan, even, even in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, when it had been gentrified. There were still some shady spots in New York City, okay? Uh, and other cities I've been to, and other places I've been to that are shady as fuck, right? Scary, sure. But once you have gone through those shady places and handled yourself, and you came out okay on the other side, maybe a scratch or two, you know, maybe a little bit of a scare or something, but you came out on the other side, it gives you confidence. It gives you confidence to handle yourself wherever you may go, right? In our neck of the woods, there's sort of like this fear of being a globalist, okay? I mean, like, okay, people talk about the globalist shills, the neocons and these bastards who are just basically part of the global elite, right? Now, the global elite, we don't really like them for various reasons because we basically think correctly that they are trying to put down the common man and that they are interested in turning the whole world into one homogenous porridge. And I, th I think that that's a fair critique of that, of that globalist elite. But see, the globalist elites, right? They, they do have a few things that they're right about. And what are they right about? Well, that you should view the world as one big space that you can explore. See, the, the globalists, yeah, they're, they're for open borders and the new world order and all that stuff. Yeah, and it's negative and we've discussed it or, or people that I'm allied to or, or sympathetic to have critiqued it. And I agree with those criticisms. But their vision of the world as one big oyster, as just the one thing, and that you can go anywhere and you can see it all. Fucking A. Fucking A.
talking to? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, you, you can you can hate Hitler and recognize that he did a good thing when he built the Autobahn, right? Yeah, the glo globalists, right? The globalist shills. I mean, I hate their guts, but they are right in their vision that you should look at the world as one gigantic stage, and you can go anywhere if you so feel like it. And if you're lucky enough to be born in the Western democracies where you have the right passports, you can go anywhere. It's cheap. It's easy. You can go today. There is always an excuse not to go. And usually that excuse is money. You always hear people say, oh yeah, I'm going to travel. I'm going to travel someday when I get the money together, you know, because it's so expensive, blah, blah, blah. They're never going to travel. They're always going to be talking about it. You know, there's a, a young fellow I know, a uh, nice kid, smart kid. And I offered to underwrite his trip to the Middle East, okay? He's a very smart kid, and he could probably make it as a journalist out there, like a freelance journalist. And I offered to underwrite, to pay for his ticket to go to the Middle East, right? And this was like a couple of months ago, several months ago, as a matter of fact. And I meant it, you know? And, and he knows that I have the means to do it, and I'd be happy to, to underwrite his... Uh, his, his adventure in the Middle East, because I think it would do him a lot of good. It would uh, get him out in the world, uh, give him some mileage, some experience, you know? So I was happy to make the offer. He's somebody that I appreciate, I think very highly of him. And he hasn't taken me up on the offer. Money is off the table. I'm gonna be financing the fucking trip for the kid, right? He doesn't wanna go. He doesn't wanna go, he's scared. He's scared. And that's perfectly normal. It's perfectly normal. But see, you have to overcome your fear. You have to overcome your fear of the unknown. You have to overcome your fear of what might happen. See? In 1991, I went to Cusco in Peru. Now, there were two ways to go to Machu Picchu, which is about... Um, Oh, I guess about 70, 80 kilometers away, 50 miles. One way was to take a train. You take the train from Cusco to the bottom of Machu Picchu, because Machu Picchu is actually on a hill, right? You get to the bottom of the hill and you climb the hill, you know? And, and you know, the, the train takes two, three hours, and, uh, or perhaps a bit more, and uh, the climb up takes another two, three hours, right? The other way to do it is to go on the Camino del Inca, the Inca Trail, right, which is basically going through the jungle, hiking through the, the jungle, right? And you can go, you know, with, with porters and a guide and the whole nine yards, or you can go solo, right? <laughs> so me and a buddy of mine we were so fucking crazy that we decided to do it solo, right? Uh, yeah, because we were 22. What did we know, right? So we did the Inca Trail three fucking days, you know. I got leeches. Uh, real leeches and lucky that we were smokers both of us were smokers because yeah because of the smoking we were like constantly out of breath right but because we had cigarettes we were able to burn the leeches off our legs mm -mm. true story <coughs> it was scary after the second day we started thinking that we were lost right and by the third day we were starting to panic because you know we, were, we had seen some ruins along the way because there are actually like minor ruins along the way before you get to uh, Machu Picchu but on the third day we were really panicking we were thinking man where, where the fuck are we right we are just so fucking lost and finally we got there we, we got to it and we we got to the spot where all the 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 what you call it the uh, tourists arrive and that's why we knew because we were going up the hill Right, and we were thinking this this may be it, might not be it. I don't know. It looks like a trail, but you know the jungle grows so quickly, right? And so we we're going up, right? And we we're getting there, and we're going up and up, and and we're like kind of freaking out. And also because there's so much vegetation, it sort of covers you, and so it's like you're going through this dark tunnel, right? And we were going up and going up and scared and scaring ourselves. And as we're rising and we're getting to the crest of the hill, we started hearing people, right? We started hearing people. And we broke through the vegetation up on the crest of the hill, right? And we got to that spot where all of those pictures of Machu Picchu are taken, right? Where you see, see on the other side, the other hill, Huayna Picchu, rising up, right? 
and uh, and we were there. Yeah, yeah, and it was quite the experience. And the jungle has never been scary to me after that. And I've had the opportunity to go through the jungle. I'll tell you about it some other time, but the point. See, that was the first time I'd hiked through the jungle. It scared the shit out of me, right? And after that, you know, no problem. I can handle myself, you know. And that happened to me nearly 30 fucking years ago, right? It made me better, you know. You're young. What the fuck are you doing at home watching a fucking YouTube video? Sell your shit, sell your car, sell all the crap that you don't need. Your fucking video games and game consoles and stupid ass computers. Get on a fucking plane and go to Machu Picchu. Go to the pyramids. Go to wherever the fuck you want to go. It's out there. It's out there. It's waiting for you. Go now before it's too late.